Those announcements, then we are ready to look into God's Word together this morning. And as an introduction to where we're going to be in Romans chapter 2, I'd like to share with you the story of Harry R. Truman, not to be confused with President Truman, but this is Harry R. Truman, who was born in 1896. And his final months in 1980 made him the most famous victim of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. The deadliest eruption of a volcano in our nation's history was there in May of 1980. And leading up to that, Harry R. Truman became a minor celebrity in our culture because of his refusal to leave the mountainside. You have him pictured here with his wife, Edna. They were married for 37 years and they built the lodge and ran it there. The, the lodge on the side of the mountain, Mount St. Helens Lodge at Spirit Lake near the foot of the mountain. And she had died three years before the eruption of the volcano. And so he was left alone as a widower. And I'd like to read for you a, a well-written article about Mr. Truman. He became a minor celebrity during those two months of volcanic activity preceding the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. He was giving interviews to reporters and expressing his opinion that the danger was exaggerated. He said, I don't have any idea whether it will blow, but I don't believe it to the point that I'm going to pack up. Truman displayed little concern about the volcano and his situation. He said, if the mountain goes, I'm going with it. This area is heavily timber timbered. Spirit Lake is between me and the mountain. And the mountain is a mile away. The mountain ain't going to hurt me. Law enforcement uh, officials were increasingly annoyed by his refusal to evacuate because the media would come and keep on interviewing him and entering into that restricted zone, endangering themselves in the process. But Truman was steadfast. He said, you couldn't pull me out with a mule team. The mountain's part of Truman, and Truman's part of that mountain. He's on the front page of the New York Times, the San Francisco Examiner, uh, magazines like Time, Life, Newsweek, Field and Stream, and Reader's Digested, write-ups on him. And uh, the historian Richard Slada said his fiery attitude, brash speech, love of the outdoors, and fierce independence made him a folk hero that the media could adore. As the likelihood of the eruption increased, state officials tried to evacuate everyone from the area, and on May 17th, they attempted one final time to get Mr. Truman to leave, which of course he refused. The volcano erupted the next morning, May 18th. The entire northern flank of the mountain collapsed. Truman was alone at the time in his lodge, which was closed. Here's Truman uh, at the time of the eruption in 1980, shortly before. The article says, it's likely that he died of heat shock in less than a second before his body was vaporized. The largest landslide in recorded history and a pyroclastic flow traveling atop the landslide engulfed the Spirit Lake area almost simultaneously, destroying the lake and burying the site of his lodge under 150 feet of volcanic landslide debris. Authorities never found his remains. He was portrayed by Art Carney in the 1981 docudrama St. Helens, and Art Carney was his fa favorite actor. And more than a hundred songs had been written in his honor by 1981. I like this quote. Harry Truman spit in the face of death. But on May 18, 1980, death responded with both barrels. Pointed right down the volcano's north flank and into his front door. Truman, his pink Cadillac, his herd of cats, and a lot of good whiskey ended up beneath a couple hundred feet. A rearranged volcano. I start off with that story this morning because it is a illustration, it's a reminder that Judgment Day is coming. God has sent his prophets, God has sent his warnings. He has sent all of the Old Testament prophets to predict the great and terrible day of the Lord. He sent his son Jesus Christ. He sent Jesus with the message that he gave to John and John wrote down in the book of Revelation that the great and terrible day of the wrath of God is coming, and it will come quickly. And you won't have time to escape. There will be no mine shaft that you can get to that will preserve your life. That like Mr. Truman, if you spit in the face of death, death will answer back with both barrels. And that's where we are in our study in Romans chapter 2. It's a study 
of the coming wrath of God. If you have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 2, I'd like to remind you of where we have been. You see in Romans chapter 2 verse 6, this warning, He will render to each one according to his works. That, that verse 6, it comes right after verse 5, which tells us, Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God's righteous judgment is going to be revealed. God has waited long. He's given many warnings. And if we do not heed those warnings, then the day of wrath will overtake us, in which God will render to each one according to his works. I've got a few verses here from the Old Testament that also drive that point home. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, we read that, God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. That we might present a, a good show to others, but God knows the secret things. He's going to judge the secret things. As it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. It was warned about in Ecclesiastes. It's warned about here by the Apostle Paul. This is part of the gospel. Notice that Paul says there in verse 16, According to my gospel, God is going to judge by Christ Jesus. The gospel that he preached when he was in Athens, in Acts chapter 17. He told the people that were listening there, the philosophers gathered on Mars Hill, that God, has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. The day is fixed. God has appointed it. He has determined it. He hasn't told us what day, but he's told us that it is a, a sure thing, that he has fixed it by his own plan. He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, Christ Jesus. And of this he has given us assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul was preaching this gospel, and part of that gospel is the coming judgment. Another verse from Ecclesiastes, well, let's do this one first. Another verse from the Gospel of John, John chapter 5, verse 22, where Jesus said, The Father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. So Jesus is the judge. Jesus is the one who will judge the secrets of man. He is the one that God has appointed in order to bring judgment and justice upon the sins of each individual man and woman. Now, Ecclesiastes. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and for every work. In our adult Sunday school, we've been looking into some of the other religions in the world. And how they deal with the question of, how does justice work? You see that Solomon, as well as Buddha, as well as the teachers in Hinduism, they, li they looked at life under the sun. And they said, you know, it seems like there's not any justice. It seems like sometimes those who are extremely wicked, they prosper and succeed in their wickedness. And they have a long life and they die without any difficulty. Everybody dies. And the righteous, it seems like sometimes they're, they're doing everything right, but then everything goes wrong for them. They die at a young age, and it just doesn't seem like there's justice in this life. And so the, the Hindu, he says, well, there must be a, a reincarnation. There's such a thing as karma, where the evil that you have done, if it doesn't come back to you in this life, it's going to come back in your next incarnation. That's a solution to the problem of the injustice that we see in the world. It's not the correct solution, but it is an idea that tries to solve that problem of, what about justice? Well, the scriptures in Solomon, he says, there is a time for every work. There is a time for judgment. There is a time for justice. And God is going to do it. And so the prophets came and told us about the time when God has appointed judgment. And the person through whom God is going to judge the world in righteousness. That we will not have karma and reincarnation, that we will stand before God in the resurrection and we will be judged as he opens the book and judges each person impartially according to what we have done, according to our deeds. 
impartial judgment according to deeds is the big idea in the beginning of Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Verse 11 ends with that thought, for God shows no partiality. And that then is where we left off for our four-week study or three-week three or four week diversion, if you want to count 1 Corinthians 13 as part of that, into looking at the impartiality of God. So then this morning, we're going to continue through the rest of the chapter. And of course, you know, covering that many verses is rather ambitious. So this is probably a two week study. And what Paul then does here in verses 12 through 29 is Paul is going to lay out his case against the Jew who thought that God was going to be partial to the Jewish people. That God had given the Jewish people the law. God's revelation of righteousness. An ethical teaching and standard that would guide his people into living right. That they had God's law from Moses written down. And they had the covenant of circumcision. And their special relationship that they had with God, going all the way back to Mount Sinai, when God called them his people and separated them from the nations and made them his peculiar people, his special people. God separated them by the law and by circumcision. And this was their confidence. This was their hope. That on judgment day, we Jewish people are not going to be like those nations around us, not like the Gentiles who are going to be condemned because of their sins against God. But that we are going to be entering into God's kingdom. We're going to enter into the resurrection of the righteous because of the law. And because of our circumcision. The Jewish people had a false confidence. They had a false assurance of salvation. And so Romans 2, 12 through 29, is going to attack that false assurance. Paul doesn't attack Jewish beliefs because he hates the Jewish people. Paul attacked Jewish beliefs because he loves the Jewish people. And he doesn't want them to be misled. He doesn't want them to be surprised when Judgment Day comes that that for which they have put their confidence in was no ground for confidence at all. Much like the man living on the side of the mountain. He had his confidence that the timber line and the lake would protect him. He had his confidence that he would have time to, to make it to his mine shaft. He had confidence that the mountain would not hurt him because He'd lived there in peace with the mountain for so long. And all of those were false assurances. Which people tried and tried to dissuade him and tell him, No, you need to evacuate. You need to leave. Not because they hated him. Not because they wanted to ruin his life and separate him from the place that he loved. But because they were trying to save his life. And that's what Paul is trying to do for the Jewish people here. He's trying to save their lives. Let's look at the text together. We're probably just going to focus on the law. And that's going to take us from verse 12 down to verse 24. The confidence that the Jewish people had because of their possession of God's glorious law. Verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. You see that word for that starts off verse 12? That's an explanatory word. You always want to look at those key connecting words. And it's explaining what comes immediately before it, where it says in verse 11, God shows no partiality, which is itself an explanation of what came before that, where God is rendering to each one according to his works in verses 6 through 10. So this judgment according to works, it's going to be to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for God shows no partiality. How does God show no partiality to the Jew or the Greek in judging according to works? Well, that's what this section is going to explain. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. Now, every time I come across the word law here, I want you to take note of it. I count that there are 21 uses of the word law in this section from verse 12 down to the end of the chapter. That is a lot of the word law, probably a more concentrated use of this word than any place else in scripture. This, this passage is about the law. I'll read it for you here in a moment, but let's look at this chart of the words that are used the most in the book of Romans. Of course, the word God is used the most. That's not peculiar to the book of Romans. That's probably true of a lot of the books of the Bible. 153 times God is talked about in this book. The word is mentioned. Law 
is the second most used word in the book. So if you want to know what Romans is about, well, of course, the theme is the righteousness of God by faith. But in discussing the righteousness of God by faith, one of the key concepts, one of the key words that Paul is going to use to explain the righteousness of God by faith is this word, law. It's huge here, 21 times, but also in the rest of the book, another 53 uses of that word. In fact, the use of the word law in Romans is more than all of Paul's other letters combined. You take all of Paul's other 12 letters, and you count up all the times he uses the word law in those books, it's just 47. And he uses the word law 74 times in Romans. So this is a book about the law and how that relates to God's salvation. The others, you see Christ 65 times, sin 54, Lord 43, and faith 40. You think if the theme of the book was righteousness by faith, that would be the one that's mentioned 74 times. But if you're going to understand the righteousness of God by faith, you really need to understand that in connection to the law which is mentioned almost twice as much as faith. So let's look at this passage. Follow along with me. Let's read from verse 12 down to verse 24. And you'll notice a lot of the use of the word law. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew, and rely on the law, and boast in God, and know his will, and approve what is excellent, because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. We'll stop there for now. God is going to destroy, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, the false assurance of the Jewish person in his possession of of God's law. That's the big idea here this morning. Now, he's going to do that by showing them that they are not the only ones that God has given moral instruction to. The Jewish people looked at the law and they thought, look at what we have. We have this, this wonderful moral instruction from God given through Moses, his prophet. And Paul is going to show them, well, you're not as special as you think you are. Because God has also given moral instruction to the Gentile. That's what's there in verse 14 and 15. It really focuses on how God has given the law, so to speak, in a manner of speaking, to the Gentile. And then, in verses 17 through 24, he's going to clearly demonstrate that just having the law is not enough. That the Jewish people were given the law, that was a great privilege... But when it comes to judgment, it's not whether or not you have the law, it's whether or not you do the law. Having the law and doing the law are two different things. And what's important when it comes to judgment is the doing of the law. That's what Paul is going to make very clear. And this is going to destroy the false assurance of the Jewish person. Now, you might be thinking, well, I'm not Jewish. I don't hope to be justified on Judgment Day by having the Torah of Moses. So what does this passage have to do with me? A lot. Evangelicals are basically making the same mistakes that the Jewish people made. We make them in a slightly different way, in a slightly different context. But when you examine the false assurances that exist in the evangelical world, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches, it's very much like what the Jews have done. There are millions of evangelicals who think, well, 
We've got our church. We've got our sacraments. We've got the Lord's table and baptism. And we've got Bible teaching. And I go to church every week and listen to what God taught us through Jesus Christ. Surely, I am God's person. I belong to him and I'll be okay on judgment day. We're making the same mistake that the Jewish person had. It's not that you have baptism. It's not that you have the Gospels. It's do you do what the Gospel tells you to do? Hearing and doing are two different things. So this will be very applicable to us. But let's look at it first in its first century context before we apply it to the 21st century context. Verses 14 and 15 there, I draw your attention to those verses again. They show us that the Gentiles have the law written on their hearts. The Gentiles kind of have the law too, guys. That's, what, that's the idea here in verses 14 and 15. He's explaining how God shows no partiality. The Jewish person says, well, God's given us his law. He's partial to us. Paul says, hold on a second. God has also kind of given his law to the Gentiles. Look at what he says. Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves even though they don't have the law. So they don't have it, but they kind of do have it. Because in verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So the conscience is that part of the human being, as Paul uses the word here, that tells us when we've done something wrong. That on final judgment day, God's going to open up the books and he's going to say, you did this on Saturday, May 12th. And it was a sin. It broke my law. And there's a penalty for breaking my law. And your conscience will say, oh yeah, I did. And you know what? I kind of knew it was wrong. And I feel bad about that. And your conscience will be accusing you as your deeds are read out from the book before the throne of the majesty on high. So it won't just be what's written in the book, but it's also what's written on your heart. Your heart will be confirming, oh yeah, I did those things. And I felt guilty about them. And I feel guilty about them now. God has written that law upon the heart of all human beings. The conscience that accuses us, or sometimes even excuses us. Says, well, you know, there was a good reason for what I did there. But the way that Paul states it, he states it that we're going to be accused by our conscience a lot more on Judgment Day than we're going to be excused by our conscience. Not everything we've done is, is as awful as it could be. There will be a way in which our conscience does excuse us, even on Judgment Day. But much more so will be the accusations of the conscience against human beings before God. Now when he says in verse 14 that Gentiles do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, the ESV puts a comma after the law and connects by nature with doing what the law requires. But that's not 100% clear in the Greek text. Almost all English translations will translate it the way that the ESV does. They'll put by nature with the doing of the law instead of by nature not having the law. And I, I understand why they do this. This does make a lot of sense to do it that way. But if you look at verse 27, come down to verse 27, you see, he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. Now that word physically, it's actually the same Greek word uh, as by nature. They by nature... Uh, are uncircumcised. And when Paul uses this word also in Galatians, Galatians 2.15, he says, we ourselves are Jews by birth, by nature. Same word, same phrase that is used here in, uh, what verse is it? 14. Same, same as verse 14 in Romans 2. And so we have Jews by nature and we have Gentiles by nature. So when Paul uses this phrase, by nature, he's usually talking about what people are by birth. You've got Gentiles by birth, you've got Jews by birth. So I would actually put the word by nature with the, they are Gentiles by nature who do not have the law. Now he's talking about what people are by nature of their birth. And this goes back to an important concept that I talked about last week. That God doesn't judge you according to what you've been given. God judges you according to what you do with what you've been given. The Gentiles were not given the Mosaic law. 
By nature, they were not given that. But God doesn't judge them because they don't have something that God chose not to give them. They had nothing to do with that choice. But God did give them a conscience. God did give them a moral sense. God did give them the ability to discern right from wrong. And so God is going to judge them based upon what he has given to them. What they are, by nature, is what he has created them to be. But then they are responsible by what, for what they do with the nature that God has given to them. So Gentiles, by nature, don't have the law. That's what they are naturally. But what is important is what they are spiritually, what they do with their nature. Now, when they do what the law requires, they're doing the things of the law. And the law, written on the heart, as Paul says, this is part of the moral argument for the existence of God. How do we know that there is such a thing as God? How do we know this isn't just some sociological construct of our imagination, our cultural imagination, and that God really is an object of reality in and of himself? And one of the ways that we demonstrate to the world the existence of God is the universality of human conscience. It's not like right and wrong as far as basic moral concepts are culturally determined. No matter what culture you go to, the Far East or Africa or Europe or here in the Americas, that all peoples everywhere, tribes, tongues, languages, they've all had that moral sense of murder being wrong, theft being wrong, lying being wrong, adultery being wrong. These are universal principles that the heart of mankind knows. And the only way to get around those principles is to, to really buy into some philosophical system of ethics that turns things upside down, that goes against every instinct of our moral conscience, our moral nature. So this law written on the heart is a moral argument for the existence of God because that moral law has to come from a moral God. It doesn't come from nothing, that something has to be caused by something that is greater than the effect. And the effect of morality has to come from a greater morality than, the, than that effect. So the conscience of the Gentile is law enough for judgment. See, here as Paul is speaking about the, the law written on the heart, he's speaking of condemnation by works. This whole section from Romans 1 all the way up to Romans chapter 3, verse 20, is about the condemnation of Jew and Gentile, all mankind, based upon our deeds, based upon our works. And the conscience is law enough for judgment. Now, Paul has kind of gone off on this sidetrack about the conscience of the Gentile because he's actually using this as part of his argument to under, undermine the false confidence of the Jew. Because the Jew thought, hey, we've got God's law. The Gentiles don't have God's law. And Paul's saying, well, you're not as special as you think you are, that the Gentiles do have a moral sense of right and wrong, too. They just don't have the written code like you have it. But they do have it from God in their hearts. But then secondly, the real, the real power play here against this false assurance of possessing the law then comes in verses 17 through 24. Now, he introduces the concept back in verse 13 before he went on the, the side trail on the Gentiles having the law. But if you look at verse 13 with me, there in your text, it says, It is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. That's why we have up here. The doers of the law will be justified. That's from verse 13. Now, he's going to explain that in verses 17 through 24. That... Having the law and doing the law are not the same. And while the Jews have the law, they have still not done the law. They've convinced themselves that they were doing a much better job. And that, well, well, we're doing a better job of keeping God's law than our ancestors did. Because we don't have household idols. And we don't have temples to bail in our streets anymore. So we're doing a lot better. Well, better is not good enough is what Jesus and Paul and the Holy Spirit came to tell the people of Israel in the first century. Yeah, you might be doing better, but you're still failing to keep the law. That's why they stoned Stephen. Stephen told them that they had failed to keep the law that was given to them by holy angels. And they were so incensed that they picked up stones 
and stoned him to death on the spot for attacking their false assurance, for attacking their confidence that they were acceptable to God because they had the law. So this is a very offensive section here in Romans chapter 2 for the Jewish person who would be reading what Paul has to say. And this is why Paul was persecuted everywhere he went by the Jewish people who did not want to give up their false assurance, their false confidence. Look at how Paul does it. Let's look at verses 17 through 24. He says, The doers of the law will be justified, there in verse 13. And how we understand this is then through the accusations of verses 17 through 24. Now, he's going to start off verses 17 and 18 and 19 and verse 20 by just talking about all of the confidence that the Jewish person had that is related to his possession of the law. That's why he starts off with the first one, you rely on the law. You call yourself a Jew and you rely on the law. They rest upon it. They put their confidence, their hope on the law. And they boasted in their relationship with God. And their relationship with God was mediated through the law. It was through the law of Moses that the people of Israel had this special connection to the true and living God. And so it was through the law that they could boast in their relationship with God. And these are not bad things. The law is a good thing. A special relationship with God is a good thing. And these are not false things. They did have God's law. They were God's special people. They did know his will. They were instructed from the law. They were to be a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness. They were the ones who were to be teachers of the truth that God had given them to the nations and to make disciples of the Mosaic law. But they had failed to live the truth that God delivered to them. Notice what he says about the law there in verse 20. It's the embodiment of knowledge and truth. And that's true. The law of God is the embodiment of knowledge and truth. It's perfect. That's why we read from Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus was saying, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. The Old Testament law of God, that's God's word. It's inerrant, it's inspired, it's true, it's righteous, it's holy, it's good, as Paul's going to say later in the book as he writes. So don't misunderstand Paul's attack on the Jews here as any attack on the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's wrong the way they're using the law. And so then you have the accusations that follow. They have the law. They have these privileges. This is true, but they're not doing what the law says. They teach others, they preach the truth, but then they don't practice what they preach. And he gives three examples. Theft, adultery, and robbing temples. Now, I imagine that not every Jewish person was a thief. I imagine that not every person that was a Jewish person who Paul would be preaching to was guilty of literal adultery. And I imagine there were very few among the Jews who were actually robbers of temples. So why does Paul use these three as illustrations or examples of the failure of the Jewish people to keep the law? Well, remember that that context that Paul is writing to is very much like our context. That you've got evangelical Christians, and, and we've got the Bible. We've got the truth. We've got the gospel. And we're preaching and proclaiming the truth. And we're standing up for God's morality in an immoral nation, an immoral world. And then you've got these Christians running around who are preachers on television. And they get caught embezzling. They're being paid millions of dollars in salary from the money that is coming in and from poor little old ladies who believe that they're going to use it to further the gospel. But instead they're investing it into their mansions and their airplanes. And the world knows this. It's not like they don't take notice of the Jim Bakers in the world, the Tammy Faye's. They see it. And then you get pastors who are, are bold at preaching against sexual immorality. And the next thing you know, they're in the newspaper for spending time with a male prostitute. The world takes notice. They love that story. And so, yeah, not every evangelical is, is doing all these things. But there's enough to show that evangelicals are sinners, too. 
show, hey, you guys, you think you're so righteous. You're telling us how to live life. Well, look at your own house. Look at the divorce rate in the church. It's not much different from the divorce rate in the world. Look at the use of pornography among all your pastors. You guys got problems. You're going to come preach to us. That's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, you Jews, you got problems. You're sinners too. The people in the Gentile world, they see when Jewish people rob temples. And they see when Jewish people are adulterers. And they see when Jewish people are stealing. And it happens. So don't come off telling me that you guys are keeping the law because you're not. That's what Paul's doing here. And he's talking about justification. If you look back in verse 13, he uses that key word for the first time. That it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And when we're talking about the law, remember what the law is. God said about this law in Deuteronomy chapter 4, what great nation is there? that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today. They were a privileged nation. The possession of the law was a tremendous thing. It set them apart from the other nations. God himself pointed that out to them. And then Deuteronomy chapter 4, you can go back and read those first eight verses in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and God says, do it, keep it, walk in it, hold on to it, observe it, not just hear it, not just have it. He says, do it. That's what Deuteronomy 4 is all about. They failed to do it. Here's a great illustration from a passage of Jewish literature not in the Bible. This is an Apocalypse of Baruch, and it was probably written uh, in the... What do I have here? Probably written in, in the centuries before the coming of Jesus Christ, a Jewish tradition. Ah, yes. Uh, late first century or early second century is what they say. And it says this. This is a Jewish perspective on their possession of the law. In your law, we have put our trust. Which is exactly what Paul says there, that, that you are resting on the law. You're putting your trust in the law. In your law, we have put our trust, because behold, your law is with us, and we know that we do not fall as long as we keep your statutes. And Paul said, yeah, but you're not keeping his statutes, just like Jesus said, just like Stephen said, you have failed to keep the law. But they thought, we shall always be blessed. At least we did not mingle with the nations. See, we kept part of the law. We're separate from the nations. Good for us. And he says, we are all a people of the name. We didn't mingle with the nations, for we are all the people of the name. We who receive one law for the one. And that law is among us. And that excellent wisdom which is in us will support us. They had this false confidence, this false assurance that we have the law, so we're going to be okay with God. And so the church, the evangelicals, they were around. We got, we got the gospel. We got the word of God. We got the preaching of the truth, so... We're good. No. Millions of evangelicals will be shocked on Judgment Day. And Jesus Christ will say, I never knew you. Yeah, you heard my words, but you didn't do what I said. Depart, you workers of lawlessness. Matthew 15, 14, Jesus' words to the Jewish people in his day. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And Jesus also said, Woe to you, lawyers, experts in God's law. For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering Nothing wrong with the law. Nothing wrong with the gospel. Nothing wrong with the Bible. Nothing wrong with Bible teaching. But hearers will not be justified. Doers will be justified. Now, also he mentions there that the Jewish people have the ability to discern 
what is excellent. He says there in verse 18, you know his will and you approve what is excellent. But the law, it trained the moral sense and gave people the ability to discern right from wrong and better from best and to be able to make excellent moral choices. This is what Paul was talking about when he wrote the Philippians. And he was praying for them that they would have this ability. That as they grew in grace, as they grew in the knowledge of God's word, they would be able to approve what is excellent. This is a, a characteristic, a trait that we as Christians want to pursue, that we want to have. And the Jewish people, they, they thought that they had that. But they were deceived. They were deceived between knowing and doing. Just like James warns in his book. Don't be hearers of the law, but be doers. Now, we come down to the end of this section, and you see that the people of Israel, the Jewish people, were dishonoring God by breaking the law, just as Christians do today. And he says in verse 24, he backs this up, that this has always been the way that it's been. This is nothing new, but back in Isaiah's time, where this quotation comes from, it was the same case. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. This quotation comes from Isaiah chapter 52, which I put here for us. We've got so many verses to look at this morning. I thought we'd stay in Romans 2 and I'd just show you the verses on the screen. So in Isaiah 52 verse 5, God says, Now therefore what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing. Their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually... All the day long, my name is despised. Now, I do want to go back to a verse in Isaiah to, to see this in its own context, because it's not just in Isaiah 52, but it's throughout this whole section of Isaiah that this is a major theme, a major idea. So the quote there comes from the end of Isaiah 52, 5, but the idea is throughout that Old Testament section. So come with me to Isaiah chapter 42. Let's go from Romans 2 to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 40 through 66 is written from the perspective of the exile. That Isaiah has predicted the exile is coming. That the Assyrians were coming to take the north away. That the Babylonians would come and take the southern kingdom into captivity. And that when that happened then these words would be the words that would give instruction and insight into why this has happened and what God is going to do next. So these are actually words of comfort given in advance by the prophet to that generation that would experience the final judgment of the covenant curses in 586 B.C. and the destruction of Jerusalem. So you come to Isaiah 42 in the end of the chapter. Let's look at verses 21 to 24. It starts off there with the, word, the verse that I have on the screen. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. But this is a people plundered and looted. They are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons. They have become plunder with none to rescue, spoil with none to say, restore. Who among you will give ear to this, will attend and listen for the time to come. Who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned, in whose ways they would not walk, and whose law they would not obey? They had the law, but they didn't keep the law. It was true in Isaiah's time. It was true in Jesus' time. The nation of Israel had a few short years after this letter was written to the church in Rome before another great judgment came upon them. The Romans came in AD 70. They burned the temple. They destroyed the city. The people of Israel were scattered. And the curse of God came down as the people were hidden in holes. Yeah, they had been boasting in the law. They say, look, we've got this special relationship with God. We've got God's law. All the nations should look to us as this light that is shining in the world. And God says, your light is darkness. You've got my law, but you've broken it and dishonored it. You've rejected my own son and cast out the apostles. You who say that you love God, 
but by all of your actions you dishonor his name. The same as in Isaiah's time, the same as in Jesus' time. And that's what Paul is writing about here in Romans chapter 2. He says, because of you, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. And because of the church, the name of God is blasphemed among the nations today because we say the truth. We teach the truth, but we do not do what God's word tells us to do. And so don't be part of that. Don't be part of the evangelical world that says and doesn't do. Don't be the hypocrite. Be the man of integrity. Be the person who proves and demonstrates that there is a God, there is a Savior, that He is holy, and that He can make you holy. Don't be contented with just having the gospel. Do what the gospel says. And the gospel says, repent. The gospel says, believe. The gospel says, allow the power of Christ to transform you, to fill you, to make you holy as God is holy, to make you perfect like he is perfect. Don't be contented to be an evangelical. Don't think, I'm okay because I'm as good as these other Christians. Is Christ in you? Is Christ in you? <clears throat> that is the test. And if Christ is not in you, then you fail the test. And you have a false assurance, a false confidence. We are here to destroy false confidence. That's what the Word of God is attempting to do today. So I have to examine myself. You have to examine yourself. 